Hey, Tom, can you hear me? It's yep. Chris. Chris, um, Kirsten, you okay? Yep. Yeah, can you hear me? Um, a little bit. Try it again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. You can? Yes. Oh my gosh, I figured it out. This is, <laughs> this is amazing. You guys don't understand. You guys are all live. <laughs> no, that I figured out how to use my computer. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yes. So, um, as Bill said, we are live, so, and there are a few people on, um, oh. <laughs> so we can embarrass ourselves if we want to. Um, but otherwise, you can mute yourself and, um, you know, come back on at uh, right about when I start. Okay, I'm officially muting myself then. Okay. Tom, it's Chris. Can you hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Great.
So hi everyone, this is Tom Adams with the Ocean Project. Um, I have 12.59, we're gonna wait another minute or two. Um, we usually have a bunch more people join us a minute or two after one o'clock um, and then we'll get going. So hang tight, I'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, we're gonna get started again. Um, I'm Tom Adams, I'm with The Ocean Project and thanks for joining us. I hope wherever you are, if it's not warm, it's getting warmer. Um, it's cold in DC. Um, but again, thanks for joining us. And um, as somebody who spent more time than he cares to have in DC, this stuff is really important we're gonna talk about today because this is where a lot of uh, decisions get made um, a lot of attention gets spent on Congress. Every one of our webinars thus far have been on Congress. Um, and so today, I think it's good for us to turn to the executive branch and get people more familiar with how uh, those processes work. So, um, let's see here, okay. So um, this is what we're trying to get through today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what happens to a bill after it be, gets signed into law. Um, we're really excited to have Chris Sari here from the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation to talk about uh, the Marine Sanctuary, system, Marine Sanctuary system, uh, the foundation, uh, as well as um, a great event, uh, great events that they have um, every year that zoos and aquariums can uh, participate in. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the rulemaking processes, just to sort of tell you how they work um, and stay sort of at a 40,000 foot level because it's really easy to get into uh, nitty gritty on this stuff, um, but we're gonna try to avoid that. Uh, and then I'm also excited that Kirsten Swartz from Woodland Park Zoo is able to be with us today. Um, last year, they did a great campaign on proposed changes, regulatory changes to the Endangered Species Act, and she's gonna talk about uh, how they did it and what they learned. Uh, and as I said, it was really successful. And then I'll close out very briefly talking about executive orders, which uh, you probably hear more about than you realize, uh, and then leave some final thoughts and takeaways. So, um, I'd like to always start or include this slide in our events or in our, in our webinars to talk to you about some days where uh, you should be aware of, of things that are happening. The first two are, um, as you know, the State of the Union was postponed. It is now gonna be on Tuesday. 
uh, in the next few weeks, the president's budget request for fiscal year 2020, which begins October 1st this year uh, and ends September 30th uh, in 2020. Um, and then these are um, advocacy days in DC, the next couple. Um, the highlighted one is obviously AZAs, uh, which is open to everyone on here. Um, what's going on here? missing okay sorry about that um and then i mentioned capitol hill oceans week affectionately known as chow um, which is sponsored and organized by the marine sanctuary foundation is uh, the first week of june and soon after that is world oceans day and uh, the ocean project i know coordinates and works with a lot of um, institutions both in the u.s and uh, internationally on coordinating events um, last webinar, we talked about the congressional calendar. If you're going to try to get your members of Congress or their staff to come visit your institution, they take a week or two off around July 4th and they take the entire August re uh, month of August off and come back right after Labor Day. So if you want to try to get them there, it's never too early to start sending an invitation to get on their schedule. And finally, Thanks again for joining us this month. We hope we'll see you on March 1st for our next webinar, uh, First Friday webinar series. So um, I spent uh, about five or six years on Capitol Hill. The first bill that I passed, uh, worked on that passed after it was enacted. The Congressman congratulated me for getting, helping him accomplish the easy part, which was passing the law. The hard part is making sure it's implemented correctly. Uh, so, um, what happens right after a bill is signed into law, uh, the agencies who have been following it, the legislative process begin to try to figure out, you know, what the bill really means and what it's intended to accomplish. They'll do a bunch of meetings. Uh, they'll do a lot of legal research. They will talk to the congressional offices that worked on the legislation to make sure they're following the right path. And then they'll initiate what's called a rulemaking process. And I'll get into that a little bit more later, what the steps are in that. Uh, they usually take up to a year, sometimes more, if they're really complicated. Um, but that is what brings legislation to life. Um, and when it's all said and done, the administration that's implementing the bill, it's going to reflect their priorities just as revisions to rules uh, will do that as well. It, you know, President Trump's administration, you're hearing a lot of talk about, um, you know, curbing regulatory excess. Well, that that's all done through a rulemaking process, and that is reflecting his priorities, um, just as past presidents have worked to accomplish theirs. So how does it sort of affect a zoo and aquarium? So bills like the Endangered Species Act, uh, the authorizing legislation for APHIS and the Marine Mammal Protection Act, Congress sets uh, legal, uh, uh, what is legal and what is not in terms of activities, but it does not specify how that gets defined and accomplished um, uh, to the level uh, that the agencies and the affected parties, interested parties, are going to know what the, what the processes are. So think about when you apply for a permit at your institution uh, that you need from the government. Congress didn't say what steps you have to take uh, and measures you need to uh, address to get the permit approved. They set broad parameters and the agencies defined it. So hopefully that makes sense uh, to you because I think that's an example that most everybody's lived through where they are. So I want to turn it over now uh, to Chris Sari who is the president and CEO of the uh, National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Um, prior to that, Chris, uh, I know, spent time on the uh, Senate Commerce Committee uh, and uh, has a good feel about, you know, how these regulations and laws uh, get uh, approved and implemented. So, uh, Chris, take it away and just let me know when you want me to prompt the slides. Oh, 
I might have lost Chris. Hold on a second. Okay, Chris, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you had fallen off. Are you there? Hi, Tom. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. Sorry. My, I had a technical difficulty. I got kicked off, and when I came back on, I was a little bit worried. So, well, first of all, good afternoon or good morning to everyone, and thank you so much for um, asking me to join today. Um, Tom asked if I could talk a little bit about the National Marine Sanctuary System, then about the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, and some of the... Um, programs we have to engage uh, Congress and the administration in uh, ocean conservation and also Great Lakes conservation issues. So Tom, if you could go to the next slide, I'd appreciate it. Yes. So usually if I'm looking at people, I actually ask people how, how many people have heard of our National Marine Sanctuary System. And uh, depending on my audience, sometimes it's only as many as about 50%. Um, but the National Marine Sanctuary System in 2022 actually celebrates its uh, 50th anniversary. And it was set up along the lines of the National Park Foundation. Um, Congress recognized the value of setting aside nationally significant areas in our oceans and our longer coasts and also within the Great Lakes to protect unique ecological, historical, cultural, and scientific resources. And so on that slide, you can see a map actually of where uh, we have 13 national marine sanctuaries and two marine monuments. Um, the, I just wanna explain one thing about the system because it can sometimes be confusing. So the National Marine Sanctuary Act allows for the designation of sanctuaries. The Antiquities Act, which allows for the designation of monuments is something um, that the president does. And when the president makes a declaration, he can say what agencies should be involved. And in the case of Papahanaumokuakea and Rose Atoll, he said that the Office of National Marine Sanctuary should play a role in terms of management. So that's why you see two of six marine national monuments included within the National Marine Sanctuary System. And we're also really excited for um, under the last administration and, and with the continued support of this administration, um, for the first time, we're hoping to designate two new national marine sanctuaries. One not very far from DC in Mallows Bay, so that's the blue dot on the East Coast, and then one in Wisconsin um, in Lake Michigan, um, and that's the, the dot that you see in the Midwest. But one of the things you'll just see noted at the bottom, these, these sites protect rare and threatened and endangered species. They also contain nationally significant ecosystems, as well as have, preserve a lot of maritime resources um, too. And they're huge, kind of like our parks, huge generators to local economies. This is a very old number, but it's estimated that about $8 billion is generated annually by our sanctuary. So, have a very strong conservation goal, but also a very important economic goal to the country too. So Tom, could I have the next slide? Uh, National Marine Sanctuaries, there's two ways to designate them. First, um, the act is, as Tom was talking about, um, creates an administrative process. So um, NOAA and the Secretary of Commerce working with local communities can go through a rulemaking process to actually designate an area um, within the U.S. as a National Marine Sanctuary. So the two sites that I just mentioned that are under designation are going through that actual process. They can also be done through a legislative process, and that legislative process is when Congress uh, steps in to create um, National Marine uh, Sanctuaries. And thanks, Tom, for advancing. That's uh, the <laughs> couple of those are the Florida Keys, Hawaiian Island Humpback Whales, Stellwagen Bank, Stetson Bank, which is down in the Gulf um, as well. And if you don't mind going back one more time, I'm sorry, I got ahead okay. of myself a little bit. <laughs> um, so today we have 14 sites in the system. And what's really important about National Marine Sanctuary um, Program, it's a very community and stewardship based program. So at each of these sites, there are sanctuary advisory committees, and these were actually written into the law, where um, stakeholders and interested members of the public um, sit on these advisory committees and can offer recommendations to the superintendent of these sites um, for 
um, for how to do management, conservation efforts, education efforts. And whoever sits on these boards, it's very um, focused on kind of the, the resource conservation mission of the sanctuary. So if there's a sanctuary near you as a zoo or an aquarium, you should definitely consider about um, can, uh, playing a role in sanctuary advisory councils. Um, we also have seven visitor centers, um, exhibits in about eight locations, and NOAA also has 50 kiosks um, across the system. Um, one center I just was gonna highlight in Hilo, Moku Papapa -pa Discovery Center, is actually a one that is um, operated by the foundation. And uh, during the recent government shutdown, we were able to keep that open, which was very important to the community of Hilo and many people that like to learn more about the marine environment in Hawaii. So um, that was one effort we did during the, the shutdown. So Tom, if you could go ahead and advance two slides, I'll talk a little bit about the foundation. Um, the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation was established, it's almost 20 years ago. Next year we celebrate our 20th anniversary. And it was really with the three major intentions. One was to increase the local, national, and international awareness of the benefits of the sanctuary and the benefits of marine protected areas um, to communities, local economies, and obviously for conservation. The other one, and I sometimes equate this to what the National Park Foundation tries to do for national parks um, or for Friends Association, often with public zoos and aquariums, is to try to raise funds for national marine sanctuary and the system as a whole. As we know, conservation programs are often um, pretty st strapped for resources. And so as a nonprofit partner, um, we can actually help the, the program solicit funds for programs from conservation to research to education. And lastly, and this is a really important one that I'll come back to and one that I think we can have great opportunities for partnerships with zoos and aquariums, is to build a constituency for stewardship of um, our oceans and Great Lakes. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, it can be really hard when the resource protected is under the water and people aren't divers or don't go out on the water a lot to get people to recognize the value of that conservation. So one of the key things that we're supposed to do is really work to build that constituency. And I think zoos and aquariums could be great partners there for us. Tom, do you mind going to the next one? Um, just a little bit more about our work. So we strive to be a nonpartisan, credible voice for marine and Great Lakes protection. So we're not really an advocacy organization in the traditional sense, but we try to talk about the benefits of, of marine conservation, Great Lakes conservation and place-based protection. One thing that I think is a little bit unique about the, the foundation itself is while the foundation is very national, because these sites are very place-based and very um, important to communities, we work very closely with local partnerships to kind of create a cohesive network of work on the ground and raising those voices up to the national level. The one thing that I think it's always important to think about national marine sanctuaries is there are great places to try to foster innovative projects, to look for solutions, to figure out how we can scale them up and then make them transferable beyond sanctuary boundaries. So what can we learn from really investing in research and conservation in these areas, about our greater oceans, and then how can we bring other people into that and transfer it much broader? So that's a lot of the focus of our work. The other thing we do is we try to leverage the public funding we get really to bring private conservation dollars in. Um, I think people often appreciate that when you're a trusted partner of the federal government, that the investing in those areas, you can also leverage those, those dollars. And then lastly, something that's really important to us is making sure we're always using strong scientific, legal, and policy expertise to inform our programs. So Tom, can I have the next slide? So I wanted to just now focus in on two conferences um, that we host um, or are hosting and talk a little bit about how to engage with zoos and aquariums. So um, for about 19 years now, the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation has hosted Capitol Hill Ocean Week, which is very affectionately known around here as Chow and the Ocean Prom. Uh, it's June 4th through 6th this year. We always do it the same week as uh, World Ocean Day, kind of as a build up to that. And what we think is really important about this conference is that it is a constituency building tool 
for conservation in our oceans and Great Lakes. It's absolutely free to the public. That's one of the big commitments that we have is that we don't want there being barriers to people coming and learning about Oceans Coast and Great Lakes. Um, we, get, we bring in policy, science, business leaders from across the country to talk on pressing issues um, when we identify new issues each year. So I'll talk a little bit about the work that we're doing this year. Um, our, our opening plenaries, or our, I'm sorry, our plenaries, I should say, are focused on grand challenges facing our oceans. And we're going to be looking at climate change in oceans, energy development, and um, transforming uh, seafood sustainability through markets. So those are our main plenaries. Then we have a series of panels. So we have smaller breakout sec sections that allow people um, a little bit more active engagement with our panelists. And those um, are going to be Oceans and Human Health. Um, we'll be looking at a variety of topics, how oceans impact health, as well as how many products in terms of um, pharmaceuticals come from our oceans. We'll be talking about um, sustainable fisheries. We'll be talking uh, about uh, wildlife conservation. And um, particularly, I think, in the sustainable fisheries and wildlife conservation, there's roles for zoos and aquariums. Um, a lot of what Monterey Bay Aquarium has done with, with Seafood Watch is really brought their, their recognition and their science to informing how we think about seafood and looking up on cards if, they're, if it's an approved species. So we're looking at kind of that market role, but also how zoos and aquariums can play a role in that, that market orientation. In the wildlife conservation, um, uh, track. We're actually having a specific panel dedicated to uh, zoos and aquariums because we recognize there's a lot of different ways um, both are engaging in terms of conservation, whether it's research in the environment on species that's important to them, um, education. Uh, zoos and aquariums have obviously been doing a lot around plastic, getting more engaged in policy issues um, such as this program. Um, and uh, also in the market forces. So we're gonna have a very specific panel uh, dedicated to that. Um, if you've never been, I really encourage you to come. It is a great networking opportunity. It's not too often you can get a free conference in Washington, DC. So um, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here, meet with peers, learn more, and also be able to get in front of the Capitol Hill and the administration. Um, this year, for the first time, we launched, and we actually launched it at Mis uh, Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut, the Blue Beacon series. Um, Chow is our kind of premier conference, but we realized we also wanted to make sure we were getting out into communities to talk about the importance of marine protected areas. And a lot of this work we're actually trying to do in association with uh, zoos and aquariums. And the reason being is, Folks that are coming to zoos and aquariums obviously have an interest in terms of animals and in terms of conservation. And so being able to engage that audience and make those connections between the works that are happening in zoos and aquariums and the conservation needs out in the broader world, we think is very important. Um, we have two more scheduled. Uh, we're going to be working with the National Aquarium in Baltimore uh, in uh, September, and we're also working on one in Detroit. So you can tell we're not just staying coastal, we're actually going throughout the country because we recognize that, that folks um, in the interior of the U.S. also care really greatly about Great Lakes and uh, marine conservation. So look forward um, to working with more zoos and aquariums. Please feel free to reach out to me if this is something that you might want to be interested in hosting one. Our, our format is very flexible. Um, panel discussions, um, speakers, uh, film watching, and then a conversation afterwards. So we're trying to make these situated best to the audience that we're approaching and the topics that they wanna hear about, but we just think it's a great opportunity to really talk about the value of uh, protected areas. So Tom, with that, I'll just stop talking now. If anybody has any questions or I'll wait till the end. Well, um Thanks, Chris. And um, that is great. And I can't stress enough for people what a great event Chow is because the panels are great. Um, you get to interact, you can meet new friends, see old friends, interact with decision makers. 
Um, and there's also a go to Capitol Hill component to it um, where you can you know, meet with your legislators uh, or their staff. And I just, as a personal aside, I did work on Capitol Hill on the bill that created the Florida Keys Marine Sanctuary. And I can say public participation has made that successful. I remember the NOAA coming and meeting with us afterwards to make sure they were getting it right. Uh, and those advisory councils really do make a difference. Um, and also the, the work the foundation has done in helping grow the system has been invaluable um, for, for what Chris has done in her time there and what the foundation's done prior to that. So um, thank you. And I do encourage you to reach out to Chris if you're interested in either of those events. And there's the Sanctuary Foundation's information, but you can find them online as well. So um, I'm going to get into the really exciting stuff here. Um, I talked a little bit about rulemaking uh, earlier. And what, what it basically is, is the, the, the administration and the agencies uh, put out a bunch of drafts, basically. They propose something, they put it out for public comment, which is part of the process. They sometimes revise a draft and then they'll put out a proposed final rule and then there's public comment and then they maybe do a revised proposal and it gets um, incredibly bureaucratic, but it all ends up in that book on the right, um, which is the Federal Register. It can also now be found online, but um, that's really boring and um, will give you insomnia. So I'll give you an, a nicer picture there. But um, we were gonna have uh, uh, Michael Krieger from uh, Cleveland Zoo speak very briefly because he is a former Fish and Wildlife Service um, employee who spent a lot of his career there working on rules. And he wanted to make one point uh, for us to relay to everybody if you're thinking about this is that rulemaking is not a popularity contest. He could not think of a rulemaking effort that was influenced by numbers of signatures. Now, it does get the attention, but you know, just stirring, and it's important to get volume uh, to show that people are concerned about it. Um, but I think he was saying substance-wise, uh, you, you really want substantive comments that don't make a difference. And he thought the best thing zoos and he thinks the best thing zoos and aquariums can do during a public comment period is offer written perspectives, uh, including compelling data uh, uh, to back them up. And I, and I think that's absolutely right. Um, we can tell stories uh, based on, you know, the science we do, the education we do, and, and what the public uh, con concerns are. Um, and I know that, you know, when AZA comments on rules, that is how they focus on it. Um, to really get the technical stuff right, they consult with uh, interested institutions. I've been part of those processes. Um, a couple of more knockdown drag outs to get the wording the way everybody wanted it. But uh, the lesson there is it's important if you're gonna comment as an institution to really sort of show that you have expertise uh, that distinguishes you from other people, but it also doesn't hurt to be engaging your guests because then that shows there is interest in the, uh, from the public. Um, I would say maybe from the career people, like Michael, maybe they don't look at those numbers, but the political people whose titles begin with deputy and assistant or deputy assistant or special assistant, uh, who are among the 4,000 political appointees in every administration, they do look at that stuff um, and because they know the Hill's going to be looking at that stuff. So anyways, um, after all the public comment periods, they finally will issue a you know, they will eventually issue a final rule. Uh, and that's when, as I said earlier, that's when the law that was passed or the amendments to a law um, sort of take on the life uh, of the intent of the bill's authors. Now, all of this stuff is subject to court challenges um, about whether it's constitutional or not. And that can slow the process down um, even further. Uh, and one place where that happens a lot is you've probably heard of the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, or NEPA. Uh, you may have heard of the Council on Environmental Quality or CEQ, which was created when NEPA was passed. But the, the significance of NEPA is it uh, ensures or requires that environmental impacts of a federal project, um, you know, in other words, a highway that federal money is being used for, 
for a private project that needs federal permits, uh, like a clean water permit, has to have an environmental assessment done to determine if there's potentially an adverse impact. And if that finding is met, then they do a very complex study an environmental impact statement, which ultimately will determine if the project can get approved um, or what modifications it needs uh, to be approved. All, every step of the way in this follows that rulemaking process on the last slide and requires public participation. Uh, it's really important, uh, especially on, on, on some projects, uh, I think for zoos and aquariums with the expertise that we have, uh, to comment on these periods and be involved in it um, at that level. So um, I'm trying not to get too far in the weeds and go through pretty quickly on this stuff. Um, and uh, and I'm sorry, I am corrected by Bill Mott that it was the Columbus Zoo that Michael is with. So I apologize uh, for that. Uh, I'm really excited to have Kirsten with us in addition to being the public affairs and advocacy manager at Woodland Park Zoo. She's the vice chair of AZA's Government Affairs Committee. Uh, and uh, I know it would encourage everyone or their colleagues to come to the AZA fly-in in, in um, Advocacy Day in May. Um, but last year, the Trump administration proposed to, quote, modernize the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and Woodland Park Zoo uh, was involved or led an effort that involved a bunch of other people. And I'll let uh, Kirsten talk about who else was there and the great results that they had. So Kirsten, the floor is yours. Thanks, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hi everybody, um, as Tom mentioned, I'm Kirsten Swartz. I do public affairs and advocacy for Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle. And I too wanna to offer thanks to the Ocean Project for inviting me to talk about this um, completely last minute whirlwind campaign that we threw together, um, which is a reminder to everybody that sometimes things, you know, building the airplane while you're flying it, sometimes you can make a pretty nice airplane. Um, and uh, so um, as um, Tom just mentioned, um, last year summertime, um, the, there was this, you folks might remember that there was this somewhat coordinated effort um, out of DC to really, really hit the Endangered Species Act, which um, was, was called, in, which I put in quotes, modernizing it. Um, I believe, and I should, I should apologize in advance that some of my memory here, that feels like 20 years ago, but um, I believe that there were about nine bills that were introduced um, from Congress to just take just just chip away at the at the act. In addition, um, three proposed rules were put out by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service, um, and it would have just significant. Um, they will, if they're if they're uh, adopted, will significantly change the way the government manages existing and future listed species. So. They were wonky, they were written in font, you know, two size, and, and they were really hard to get through. But top line, there were some issues with the, in these rules that really concerned um, Woodland Park Zoo, as well as anybody who, you know, believes in the ESA or science. And, and they were, um, they, there was, a, there's a proposal to look at the cost of listening, listing a species before, or the way that it exists now is um, the expense of listing a species is not put into consideration when um, considering, uh, determining if a species should be listed. Um, at the point of designation, um, critical habitat, designated critical habitat will be significantly reduced if these rules uh, move forward. Um, there's some really wonky stuff that I'm happy to get into offline with anyone else um, that would, as if a species is listed as threatened versus endangered threatened species, newly, newly listed threatened species would have far fewer protections than previous. Um, and then there was this little wonky rule um, that um, essentially said you can't consider the future when existing, when, when looking at uh, listing a species, which was essentially, we felt, um, undermining climate change. 
um, and, and the kind of work that we should all be doing, um, thinking about the future. So these comments were put up, or these, I'm sorry, rules were put up for public comment for 60 days. And the last day, the day the comment period closed was on September 24th, which um, many of us were here in Seattle for the ACA annual conference. So we really liked getting involved in this because like so many of us on the phone, zoos and aquariums have traditionally been considered quote neutral. Um, we are not, a, we are not um, partisan organizations. Um, and so we're squeamish coming out after Trump, coming out after um, 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 you know, elected officials who may not agree with us. Um, but when something happens like rulemaking like this, it's a very safe place for us to, to come out and speak out against us because truly um, when, when, when there are um, proposed rule changes that fly in the face of science and what we know about uh, recovering species, we, we truly believe that, that we have a voice. Um, and so we very quickly joined a coalition of, um, of the biggies um, uh, in, in the country and internationally to, to work against these rule changes. And um, I believe it was Defenders of Wildlife who threw together practically overnight a coalition of the organizations that you see here on, on the screen um, and many, many more. So I have a few of the zoos and aquariums listed here. Many more uh, joined in on this um, uh, to, the, to the best of their capacity. Um, it was, I should just say that as, you know, a little old zoo in Seattle, Washington, that, you know, is kind of scrappy and, and, and uh, you know, we, I, I'm sure we all feel that way. It was pretty cool being on the phone with Defenders and World Wildlife Fund and Earth Justice. It was, um, it was, it was a really wonderful experience. And I should say that they threw the doors open for, for us because we have the reach that they so they so desperately need. <laughs> and so um, I would encourage anyone to to um, think about partnerships with any of these organizations. They are they are ready and willing uh, to hear hear from us. All right, next slide, please, Tom. Hold on, sorry. That's all right. My computer seems to have gone. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, so um so what the larger coalition decided to do was instead of a traditional, you know, campaign of asking thousands of people to go to the government's website, the federal register, and three different times, because there are three proposed rule changes, um, right in a, that is probably going to be along the lines of, I love orcas, save them, or, you know, Trump's trying to kill, I mean, like, like, what, what Tom just said, non-substantive comments, which really don't mean much of anything. Um, the coalition decided that we would make it as easy as possible for all of the folks um, who we reached uh, to make a comment. And um, we learned that, that by writing a statement and then having people sign on to that statement, each one of those signatures counted as one comment. And um, I agree with uh, my buddy, Mike Prager, in that um, it's the substantive comments that absolutely um, matter. Um, and the way that we, we uh, addressed that was Woodland Park Zoo wrote a very thorough letter um, that, was, that was a sub substantive comment um, where we broke down the rules and we talked about what we didn't like about each of the rules. But then behind the letter we said, and thousands of people agree with us. Um, and we felt like that was a really cool thing, as Tom mentioned, to give to our elected officials, <laughs> to give to our partners in the agencies. Um, they, knew, they knew we were out doing this, um, which you'll see in a little bit how come. So um, uh, we also created a campaign plan um, that, that had other tactics as well, which I'll cover in a minute. And then um, uh, we invited as many zoos and aquariums to join us in this. And I shared that campaign plan, I think with 30 or 40 other institutions and some, some you know, took pieces of it and did what they could given the short turnaround. And it was, it was actually a really cool grassroots mobilization moment, I would say. Um, so this is a screenshot of one of the sheets of paper that we had filled in. 
um, by our guests. And so we trained up a, a handful of very extroverted volunteers and staff people to walk around on zoo grounds during our busiest season, summertime, and, and ask folks to sign on to this letter. I did it a couple times. Um, we had, you know, we obviously, much like all of you, summers when we kind of throw events and we have concerts and picnics and parties and things. And so, um, you know, any given day you went out on zoo grounds to gather signatures and there were thousands of people there. Um, and I would say that I probably got turned down one in 30, 30 people. Um, now I wanna recognize that uh, my zoo is in Seattle and I am very fortunate that I, um, ha um, that, that if I'm walking around talking about climate change and the Endangered Species Act, I think we can say generally folks um, are going to agree with me. So um, I was very careful when talking to, to zoos and aquariums and other places to, to call that out, that I know that I'm in Seattle um, and that I, in some ways, I'm, I'm pretty lucky. Um, so we asked people to walk, our, our volunteers and staff to walk around with these, um, these sheets of paper. We also sent them home with people who were having block parties and barbecues, and we got an enormous amount of comments just from people um, in the, from their personal lives. And we also built an online campaign as well, and we really promoted it through social media and drove people to a web form where we asked them to sign on as well. Um, we have a short video. Do we have time to show that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm ready? Cool. Yeah. Uh, the computer keeps going to sleep. Okay. It should pop up in a second. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christine, and I'm a lead animal keeper here at Every day, I have the privilege of working with some of the world's most endangered. I love watching our tiger brothers playing, eating, and stretching out their claws, but the survival of their species is even more precious. Oops. It's really quiet, too, Tom. It's hard to hear. I'm sorry, I'm trying to fix that. Yeah. Oh, you know what they Hello, my name is Christine, and I'm the lead animal keeper here at Wood Park Zoo. Every day, I have the privilege of working with some of the world's most endangered species. I love watching our tiger birds. Yeah, now it's stuck. Eating and stretching out their claws. It's but stuck. The survival of their species. Yeah, from this side, the video is stuck, and it's just oh. really quiet. Okay, hold on a minute. It, okay. It was Think, yeah. showing for me. I've had the opportunity to travel the globe for tigers. I've searched for poachers, snares, and set camera traps. Yeah, it's still stuck on my side. Oh, I see. Hold on. I'm sorry, hold on, let me get this. Okay. <laughs> hold on, everyone. <laughs> I gotta get <laughs> shut down a window. The Endangered Species Act is 99% successful. Changing our nation's successful landmark conservation policy doesn't make sense. Now is not the time to seek a protection. Oh, I forgot. You know what? We're gonna have to. We can move on. We yeah. can move on. Yeah. Um, it's on our website, folks. It's um, it's uh, zoo.org backslash ESA. It's a minute and a half, and it's just it just highlights one of our keepers, Christine Ann, who is one of our superstar tiger tiger keepers, and she um, just does a little something about the. Um, hey, Kirsten, the hold on a second. I gotta. I gotta. Um. I need to. Okay, it's off. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. That is okay. Sorry there about go. that. It's a great video, and it's actually <laughs> let me just say one thing. It's a great okay. example of, oh my goodness, it's on again. <laughs> okay, um, I, I I apologize about that. Um, it, it's, it, what's great about it is you've got one of your keepers um, talking about a species that she works on, um, does a great job of conveying the messages that are that are here basically on this slide of why it's important um, and what difference it makes. And I think that's a really credible spokesperson and 
uh, zoos and aquariums are full of them. So I'm sorry that I couldn't get that to work. It worked in rehearsal. <laughs> it's quite all right. Um, uh, yes, it was, it's, it's, um, we, we try to do that as much as possible as, as put our, I'm sure like you all, all you folks do is keepers are kind of the ringers for messages like this. So um, that's why we chose Christine. So what this is, what this slide is, is just a breakdown of the statement of support. This is what we asked people to read and sign on to if they agree. Um, and um, it really is truly, uh, as mentioned, just a, our, our key messages. And if you look at it, there's nothing in it that says um, the Trump administration, you know, hates animals or wildlife or endangered species. It is just very basic. Um, um, why would we muck with, uh, with our, our country's landmark conservation legislation that has a, a highly successful six, or high success rate um, and that in this time um, of, of, you know, um, climate, um, why, why are we undermining protections? We should actually be increasing them. Okay, next slide. So uh, I mentioned that there were other campaign tactics as well, um, and there were a couple that we thought were big wins for us, both um, in terms of advancing our fight to protect the ESA, but also um, just good for Woodland Park Zoo. And, and I guess I'd like to say for, for the zoos and aquariums on the line um, that um, I think the future for us is doing more things just like this taking positions, taking stands um, on, um, on, on issues based in things that we are experts about. We don't have to get into the, um, you know, the, the tax fight or the immigration fight or any of that kind of stuff, but we are experts in conservation, in wildlife, in science, and we are, to be perfectly blunt, in my opinion, um, a missing voice out there because we are so approachable by so many by, by by so many people, and so um, I don't want to in any way say that getting an opinion piece or getting our our congresswoman to come to the zoo was easy, but it was kind of easy. Meaning, it just makes sense when things are this this when things come together this quickly. It means that it makes sense. So, so um, on the on the left there, you'll see that we had an opinion piece in the Seattle Times by Alejandro Grajal, who is our president and CEO, um, about the Endangered Species Act. I would be happy to dig that up and, and email that to anyone. Um, it's a strong piece. It is not. We are not um, delicate in that piece. Uh, we 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 stay in our lane for sure, but we are adamant that this is the wrong thing to do. Um, and for any of you who know the history of Woodland Park Zoo, we have not had a good relationship with the Seattle Times. They have, they, they have, we have come after us on several occasions about um, when we used to have elephants in our collection. Um, to land this opinion piece was a big deal for us. And uh, we were really, really, we are still very proud of it. On the right is a photo of Alejandro in front of um, um, our big, big, beautiful grizzly, grizzly bear boys um, who are, of course, uh, listed on the act. Um, uh, and um, this was a press conference that we did. We had a huge turnout of media. We were really surprised, <laughs> but it was awesome. Um, on, on Alejandro's left is Lisa Gromlich, who is one of our board members, but she's also the, the, um, the dean of the College of Environmental, uh, the College of the Environment at the University of Washington. And then on, on his right is Representative uh, Pramila Jayapal, who is um, our Congresswoman. She is um, a progressive. She is an up and comer. She is going to be, uh, she has a long future, I think, in Congress. I think Tommy would agree with me. Um, and um, we have become really good friends with her. And she gave, she kind of, it was funny, Alejandro gave a lot of the science for a zoo um, background um, and talked very philosophically about what the ESA means. And then, um, the Congresswoman, she did some of the more um, hard hitting political language, which I loved. I loved that we didn't have to do that, but we gave her a forum uh, to do that. 
So um, in the, um, I should also say um, that on the opinion pieces, um, our friends at Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium landed a piece in the Tacoma News Tribune, and the Oregon Zoo landed a piece in the Oregonian. So we peppered the I-5 corridor in the Northwest. It was, it was definitely a regional effort. Other um, um, organizations had opinion pieces as well. I know that Shedd and Brookfield and Lincoln Park did a combined piece in the Chicago Sun-Times. Um, we uh, also um, had um, all kinds of other outreach online and things going on as well. Um, and in the end, we submitted about 10,000, a little over 10,000 signatures behind our substantive letter. And that was all part of an entire campaign of about 800,000 signatures um, that were submitted throughout the for, from the entire coalition. So definitely a whirlwind success effort. I'm still very, very proud of it. Um, I do need to circle back to our agencies and partners and find out where we are. I'm assuming they're going through 800,000 uh, <laughs> comments. Maybe they're not. Um, but I do want to just end by saying one last thing, and I, I want to echo what Tom just said. I invite you all um, very seriously to our AZA Advocacy Day, which is on May 8th. But we um, will be doing a series of events, fun and informative, on May 7th. Um, you will be well prepared. Uh, you will um, you will have talking points and you will understand the issues that you're talking about. Um, and for any of you who have done it, you know, I, I think you know that, it, you know, there's some jitters and some nervousness, but then after your first meeting, you're actually kind of having fun. And at the end of the day, uh, you get together with all your colleagues and you talk about some of the conversations you've had. And I just want to just say that I think that it's um, really awesome for all, or, or really important for all of us to participate in the civic process, which is going to meet with our delegates on the Hill. They want to hear from us. They want to meet with us. Um, so if any of you have any questions about that, that fly in, please let me know and I'd be happy to answer it. All done. Okay, well, thanks Kirsten. And, and if you, um, if we can help connect you to either Kirsten or Chris, if you missed their information, um, you know how to find us at the Ocean Project. So um, just a, we're right at the home stretch, only a couple more slides. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about executive orders. Um, uh, they are statements that a president will issue that have the force of law. They're somewhat controversial because um, they're seen as an end run around Congress. Um, uh, for example, Harry Truman desegregated the military through an executive order because Southern legislators would never have passed legislation uh, to do it. Uh, and um, but uh, basically, whatever party is in power, there's always a, a sense of uh, an abuse of the executive authority uh, uh, tool. And you can see that I just laugh at this because it, Obama was criticized really strongly for doing it. And, and you can see, uh, you know, he didn't do it as much as many other presidents, um, but it, it led to a lot of controversy. So, you know, but one president can make an executive order or do a rulemaking process. Uh, and, and there's nothing to stop another president from coming down the road and reversing it. And this is not an indication of what my political views are. Or I'm not editorializing here. It's just to show that the Obama administration had a priority to try to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So they passed the Clean Power Plan. They had several other things in the same area. Uh, the Trump administration came in and produced a different energy plan uh, that uh, allowed states to set their own standards, which would allow significantly more emissions. And um, same thing with the Antiquities Act. Uh, this administration uh, wants to reduce boundaries and open up areas to commercial activities, uh, particularly logging and mining and you know, off-road vehicle use, stuff like that. Um, that's their priority. Um, they've actually been looking to reduce boundaries and open up uh, national monuments created by the last three presidents uh, under the Antiquities Act. Um, and then we have uh, an issue for, you know, people who are concerned about marine issues, seismic testing, uh, to determine what oil resources may be offshore. The Obama administration found that it was not suitable and would harm wildlife. This current administration, who wants to open up offshore resources, had a slightly different view of it and came to a different conclusion. And so that's how 
executive orders can really be used by presidents to set priorities. Now, one thing I will say is the use of executive orders by a president in the, their second term in the last two years usually spikes up. Um, and that's usually when there's a lot of controversy. So you may have heard a lot about this, say during 2016, and even in the period after the 2016 election uh, and when President Trump was inaugurated. So um, here we go uh, to the end here. And I just wanted to sort of make a couple of points here, um, you know, as, as that I think reinforce hopefully uh, what we've been able to communicate today. Um, rulemaking is important because that actually is how laws get enforced. Uh, and it's not as, as I think uh, Kirsten was saying, it, it, it's not as complicated as it looks or seems to get engaged uh, on this. Um, then, you know, I hope you got a sense about the marine sanctuary system. Uh, there is a role to play in the designation and nomination process um, uh, for zoos and aquariums to help get new ones created, but then also to help the, the, the ones that exist uh, to succeed in their mission of protecting the resources within their boundaries. Uh, and then finally, you know, it's sort of a recurring theme with these webinars is there's an enormous opportunity for zoos and aquariums to engage on issues. And in this case, uh, with today's topic, it's it's on executive branch rulemaking uh, processes and decisions. So I want to thank everybody for being here uh, again today. I uh, especially want to thank the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for the funding uh, which has made this possible. Uh, we will have both a recording of the webinar and a PDF version of the webinar uh, at theoceanproject.org uh, within the next day or two. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me. And then again, uh, I just want to point out, uh, you know, we do these the first Friday of every month. So we will be back on March 1st um, with another webinar. And we thank you for joining us today and um, hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.